Good morning, my name is Rick Boddy. I'm a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Manchester and a consultant at Manchester Royal Infirmary in the UK. And today I'm going to be talking to you about my main area of research interest, which is the rapid rule out of acute myocardial infarction in the ED and how we can use high sensitivity cardiac troponin to allow us to do that so much better than we were ever previously able to do. So this is about patients who come in with chest pain predominantly, and they make up a huge proportion of the patients that we see in the ED and represent around about a quarter of all of our acute medical admissions to the hospital. Now, although we suspect the diagnosis in so many patients, only a small minority of them actually have an acute coronary syndrome. So less than one in five will be diagnosed with ACS and much less than that will be diagnosed with an acute myocardial infarction. Most of the patients we admit are only being admitted for diagnostics because we suspect a serious diagnosis, but the vast majority of them actually have a non-threatening diagnosis like gastroesophageal reflux or musculoskeletal chest pain. They don't really need inpatient care. Well, they're only there because we couldn't be sure that it wasn't an acute myocardial infarction when they first came in. If we could improve the diagnostics, we could cut down on unnecessary hospital admissions, reduce ED crowding and exit block, and allow our patients to get earlier reassurance. Well, thanks to high sensitivity cardiac troponin assays, we now can do that. And to understand how we can do that, we need to understand a little bit about the assays themselves. So this slide shows you what used to happen with cardiac troponin assays before we had high sensitivity assays. And we need to understand a few really important terms. So at the bottom, we've got the 99th percentile. That's the upper reference limit for the, for the test or the assay. And that's essentially our cutoff between normal and abnormal. Now we derive that by getting a cohort of at least 300 men and at least 300 women who are apparently healthy. We measure their cardiac troponin and we set the cutoff at the 99th percentile of the values that we get in those healthy individuals. And that's what we mean by the 99th percentile. So to diagnose MI, we need a concentration above the 99th percentile. The LOD is the limit of detection of the assay, and that's essentially the smallest amount of troponin that the test can detect. And then we've got the CV, the coefficient of variation now. Every assay has some imprecision. If you measure the same sample over and over again, you get some scatter in the results. You won't get exactly the same result, even with the same sample. And the smaller the concentration you're trying to measure, the greater the imprecision, or the, the higher the CV in general. Now with the contemporary troponin assays, the CV used to be inadequate for making diagnoses uh, until you get to a concentration well above the 99th percentile. So this 10% CV, the coefficient of variation had to be less than 10% and we didn't hit that until we got a concentration of troponin way above the 99th percentile. And meanwhile, we couldn't detect troponin in apparently healthy people. The 99th percentile and the limit of detection were exactly the same. That's changed with high sensitivity troponin assays. So our 99th percentile is still pretty much the same. But now we can detect troponin concentrations that are well below that. We can detect tiny troponin concentrations, even in healthy people. And that 10% CV, that point at which where we have adequate precision of the troponin assay, has shifted right down below the 99th percentile. So it gives us greater confidence that if we see a level just above the 99th percentile, that it really is a true value. And what that means is we can start to use more of this information contained within the troponin concentrations that are within the normal range. And we can set cutoffs really low. So that now allows us to achieve direct rule out, where we do one test at the time patients arrive in the emergency department and we rule out acute myocardial infarction for a proportion of patients. And there's loads of evidence to show us that we can do that. This slide summarizes a collaborative meta-analysis that I was involved with, summarizing the data from 11 studies and over 9,000 patients, and showed that if you've got a high sensitivity troponin T concentration of below five nanograms per litre, so that's the limit of detection of that assay manufactured by Roche, and you've got no ECG ischemia, then we could rule out 
not just acute myocardial infarction, but major adverse cardiac events within 30 days. And we could achieve a 98% sensitivity using that strategy. So a really big study, really high sensitivity. We can show the same thing with the Abbott troponin eye assay, with the Siemens troponin eye assay, with Beckman's assay, with lots of the high sensitivity troponin assays that we now use. One test and a proportion of patients, something like a quarter or a third, could be ruled out. So that's great for us in the emergency department. But we can do even better than that for the remainder of the patients. So some patients go home after one test. The remainder used to stay there for 6 to 12 hours before we had high sensitivity troponin assays. And now we can achieve rapid rule out in as little as one hour for the remaining patients who still need a second sample. So this slide just summarises the one hour rule out algorithm. Again, I've chosen data from the high sensitivity troponin T assay, but there are similar data for other assays too. So with this assay, if your first concentration is below 12, so that's just below the 99 percentile, which is 14. And if you have a change of less than three nanograms per litre, when you do the second test an hour later, then we could rule out an acute MI. And we'd achieve good sensitivity, 96.7% in this multinational study that I've cited here. We were involved in that in Manchester. We could rule out 63% of the patients with that one hour rule out algorithm. So it would really unburden our crowded emergency departments. Both of those strategies are now recommended by the European Society of Cardiology and in the UK by NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. So that's a real, real improvement for us. How about decision aids? I'd like to spend some time now telling you about decision aids for acute coronary syndromes. What do we mean by decision aids? Well, I mean, these are risk scores that pull in other information apart from the cardiac troponin result, like details of the patient's symptoms or the past history. What value do they add and are they still actually helpful when we've got such great diagnostics with high sensitivity troponin? Do we still need them or is it as simple as just measuring troponin on arrival and an hour later? Well, we've got some great decision aids. We've got the heart score, of course, that many people are familiar with. The heart score is like the APGAR score in that we have uh, five elements, the history, ECG, age, risk factors and troponin, and we score each of them from zero to two points. If you score less than four points, you're low risk and you can go home. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the heart score in a moment, but before I do, I'm going to tell you about the TMAX decision aid that we developed in Manchester. And this combines the history, the ECG and the troponin from patients, and it uses an algorithm that requires a computerised calculation. We could make it into a checklist, but I like the way that the granular data we get from a computerised calculation. And we then calculate the probability that the, the patient has an acute coronary syndrome. Based on that probability, we stratify patients into four groups. We have the rule in group, the rule out group, and then two groups in the middle, which I'll tell you some more about in a minute. This is how we use the TMAX algorithm in practice. We have to we operationalize it by going to a computer. We plug in the data. Is the patient got an ischemic ECG? Are they sweating, vomiting? Does the pain go to the right arm or shoulder? Do they have worsening angina? Are they hypotensive? What's the troponin on arrival? And based on all of that information, we'll get the probability that the patient has an acute coronary syndrome, the risk group, and a suggestion about what we can do. In this case, we can consider the diagnosis of ACS to be ruled out. We've validated the TMAX decision aid in around about 1,500 patients from three different hospitals. You can see that in the rule out group, only around 0.7% of patients had a myocardial infarction. In the rule in group, over 90% of patients had acute myocardial infarction. 40% of patients could be ruled out with one blood test using TMAX. That's a greater proportion than we could have got home using troponin alone with the direct rule out strategy using the limit of detection as a cutoff. In the middle, we've got the low risk and moderate risk groups. That's important because we still need to manage the patients that have got to stay in the hospital for a second test. And we're not quite sure if they have a myocardial infarction or not. So the low risk group here, we consider that they're suitable for an ambulatory care environment. They can sit in a chair, they don't need to hit a hospital bed. 
And if the second troponin test is normal, they'll invariably go home. In the moderate risk group, we've got patients with ischemic ECGs, maybe mild troponin elevations, uh, maybe they've got crescendo symptoms, and they might need a little bit more workup. So they go to the moderate risk group. Some of them can still go to a chair in our institution and they can get ambulatory CTCA. Others will stay in hospital and have their inpatient investigations, but it's actually a small group. And you can see we effectively risk stratify across those groups. We then looked at this with the Siemens high sensitivity troponin eye assay, and uh, you can see how the, the TMAX decision aid performs against other comparable decision aids. We've got the heart score, the EDAC score, and the TIMI score. You can see that in the rule out group, both TMAX and EDAX had only a small proportion of patients with acute myocardial infarction. Both TMAX and EDAX ruled out a lot of patients with a single blood test. TMAX had a very high positive predictive value in the rule in group, and of course risk stratifies across these groups, and it did so better than the other scores. It also performed better than the limit of detection direct rule out strategy, just using troponin by itself. We got more patients ruled out with Tmax and the same sensitivity, same negative predictive value. We've also compared Tmax to the clinical judgment of clinicians. To do that, we asked clinicians to decide what they thought the probability of acute coronary syndrome was, and they marked it using um, a zero to 100 scale probability. Tmax, of course, calculates that, and we can then plot the rock curves. And here you can see from nice research, one of my colleagues, Govind Oliver, led on this one. We can see that the area under the curve for Tmax is 0.93, whereas it's 0.76 for clinicians. So Tmax gives us better accuracy than clinicians' estimates. So having validated it as we have, we then moved on to implement this across Greater Manchester, my region. One of the most important things to do when we were implementing this was set up this ambulatory care environment where patients only go to chairs. They don't go to hospital beds, as you can see here on the right. And that's really important because it means that the low risk patients aren't over medicalized. They go to this ambulatory care environment they wait for their second troponin result and very efficiently they can go home if it's normal. Whereas if once you hit that hospital bed, you wait for your sort of once or twice daily ward rounds and things just slow down. The patient medicalizes the situation and the turnaround time of admission is just a lot longer. So how much risk is too much? You know, I've, none of those decision aids have got 0% miss rate. None of the troponin based strategies have a 0% miss rate. How do, who decides whether 1% risk is okay? Well, you could ask emergency physicians that question. And in fact, Martin Than from New Zealand led an international survey and asked just that question. But emergency physicians were quite risk averse. They would accept generally less than 1% probability. In fact, you didn't get to a sort of majority of the emergency physicians accepting a given risk until we got to less than a, one in a thousand uh, MACE rate, major adverse cardiac event rate within 30 days. Maybe we could share the decision with patients. Maybe patients might have an interesting perspective on that. Shouldn't they be making a decision about what's an appropriate risk for them? And that's where we could use shared decision making. Now in the US, Eric Hess led a really nice trial called Chest Pain Choice, where patients were randomized to either normal processes or care guided by shared decision making. And in that case, they got a chance to have a say in the decision making process about whether they'd go home or have any more investigations in hospital. And in a shared decision making arm, patients tended to know more, they engaged more with the decision making process. And interestingly, they more often chose to go home and there weren't, there weren't any signals towards that being less safe than staying in hospital as a routine. So maybe that's the key to sustainable healthcare. And with Tmax, one of the advantages is that we can personalise that process because we calculate the probability of ACS using a contemporary decision aid. And then we can communicate that with patients to make sure that their involvement into the decision making process is fully informed. 
So we've told so far about lab troponin assays. Let's just spend a few minutes on point of care troponin assays. They're very exciting. So you have the rapid turnaround time of point of care assays. We did some work with that too. The problem with point of care assays is they're not as sensitive as the lab assays. But when we use the ISTAT uh, troponin assay, which is again, nowhere near a high sensitivity troponin assay, alongside Tmax, with two tests, three hours apart in the ED, we found really good performance. This is a multi-center study at numerous centers across the UK. And in this study, we found great sensitivity for acute MI, great positive predictive value for acute MI, and risk stratification across all of the risk groups. So we now use that in urgent care centers where there's no on-site lab facility to do your high sensitivity troponin test. What about pre-hospital testing? Now I had the privilege of supervising Abdul uh, Roman Al Gamdi, who's back in Saudi. He's a critical care paramedic. He did a PhD with me, and we ran the Presto study, the pre-hospital evaluation of sensitive troponin study, at four ambulance trusts in the UK, eleven hospitals, and we consented eight hundred and twenty-one patients to this study. We've got some preliminary results now. So first of all, we looked at whether paramedics could use the heart score. Uh, and a point of care troponin assay, it's the Roche Cobas H232 assay. Uh, and when paramedics used this, we found this essentially for acute myocardial infarction, 4.1% of patients in the low risk group had an MI, in the high risk group, 41.5% did. So the sensitivity is about 86.4%, negative predictive value 94. That agrees with the findings of the ACCESS study in Scotland, which did something very similar. Now we were very pleasantly surprised to see that Tmax worked very well in this cohort. In the rule out group, only 0.9% of patients had an acute MI. So that gives us a sensitivity of 98.3% and negative predictive value of 99.1. And in the rule in group, you can see a positive predictive value of 65%. So this is, I think, the first evidence to suggest that we could use point of care troponin testing in the ambulance. And this is a, a work in progress. These are preliminary findings. So our future work will focus on uh, implementing uh, pre-hospital troponin testing uh, to see if we can feasibly do it, if we can actually run it. In the Presto study, we collected blood samples and tested them in hospital using the point of care assay. Now we've actually got to look to implement those assays and see if paramedics can run them successfully in the field and calculate Tmax. Then we'll be running a multi-center RCT, randomized controlled trial, to see if using it is safe and effective. And there are now some high sensitivity cardiac troponin assays available at the point of care. Our big question is whether the performance of Tmax will improve further when we use those highly sensitive assays. There are some challenges to implementing point of care testing. First of all, we need the evidence base, particularly for these new assays in whole blood. We, the cost is an important issue. It costs more than standard laboratory-based troponin testing. And of course, you've got to buy lots of analyzers for the ambulances, so that's an important challenge. And we've got an important training issue if we're going to use point of care troponin testing in the ambulance, which is going to be a big challenge. But if we can overcome it, the benefits are really clear. We could rule out acute myocardial infarction, even without transport to the hospital. So in summary, there's really strong evidence that we can rule out acute MI with troponin with one test based on really low cutoffs at or around the limit of detection of the assay. There's really wrong, strong evidence that we can rule out more patients with a second test an hour later. With Tmax, we can get even greater efficiency. We can risk stratify our patients at the front door, ruling in and ruling out acute MI for even more patients. And we can stratify patients to appropriate areas to have that second troponin test where it's necessary. In the future, pre-hospital point of care troponin testing could really revolutionize what we do. It could prevent unnecessary transports to hospital. And we can, we've got to look at shared decision-making evolving algorithms like Tmax with machine learning and further, further improving these already revolutionized pathways for patients with suspected ACS. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope that's been valuable and it's been a pleasure to take part in the SESAM conference in 2022. Thank you.